Hello, and welcome to the third webinar in a series of webinars that will address issues related to the seismic retrofit of unreinforced masonry buildings. My name is Nicholas Fan, and I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And we've partnered with the Association for Preservation Technology Northwest Chapter to bring you this series about unreinforced masonry buildings, which was originally scheduled to be an in person event in Seattle this past May. But due to the ongoing pandemic, we are here with you virtually and I'm glad that you're all able to join us. We'll cover an array of topics related to URMs over the next couple of weeks, and we've already had a couple uh, webinars in this series, so if you've joined us in the past, thank you for joining us. And if you've missed them, uh, then you can go to our website uh, to view previous webinars, as well as to register for the remaining in the series, uh, one of which is actually tomorrow at the same time. We'll provide a link in the chat box, uh, so you can click on that and register or view previous webinars. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have questions throughout the webinar, either related to the content or having a technical issue, feel free to use the Q&A box and we will do our best to address your question, comment, or issue. And we are also happy to provide AIA credits to those of you today that have requested them. At the conclusion of the webinar, we'll send you your AIA numbers to the AIA in order for you to receive credit. The AIA learning objectives are understand how a typical URM building is constructed and evaluate different retrofit options based on project requirements and existing conditions. Understand differing levels of code compliance that includes meeting collapse prevention, life safety, immediate occupancy or operation based on project requirements. Understand construction typologies, current conditions and engineering properties of existing buildings through testing standards found in IEBC and ASCE 41 using investigative methods such as diagnostic testing, surface penetrating radar, and flat jack testing. And finally, understand how historic research of a particular property can properly inform the design team of existing conditions, alterations over time, or material properties and strengths. Today's 75 minute presentation will cover the nuts and bolts, if you will, of seismic retrofit design. Topics include discussion around selecting the right code path, depending on use and performance objectives understanding how to creatively use research and archival resources to determine existing strengths, understanding how to determine existing material strengths, and ultimately how to determine the best possible option for a seismic retrofit solution that meets both the programmatic and code requirements of a project while maintaining historic integrity. Joining us today are our speakers, Dan Say, Michael Schuler, and Maya Foti. Dan Say is the founder and president of Swenson Say Faget Structural Engineers in Seattle, and he routinely works with architects, developers, contractors, and building owners who focus on preservation and restoration. His 39 year career has been centered around historic renovation, adaptive reuse, and the retrofit of existing structures to maintain and enhance their useful lives. Iconic historic buildings include the seismic retrofit of the Pike Place Market, seismic retrofit of the ECFE. FX McRory's office building, the adaptive reuse of the j &M Hotel, the Bellingham Federal Building renovation, multiple Carnegie Library renovations, the Alaska State Capitol Building renovation, the adaptive reuse of Washington Elementary School for Ellensburg City Hall, renovation of Fort Townsend City Hall, the Penrose Hotel Building seismic retrofit, and renovation in Walla Walla, <laughs> hundreds of other structures, excuse that, uh, Dan served on the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation Board of Directors for six years as well, and the AIA Seattle Board of Directors for five years, and is currently an honorary member of the AIA Seattle. Our second presenter, Michael Schuler, is the president of Atkinson Noland & Associates, a consulting engineering firm specializing in evaluation and repair of histor existing structures out of Colorado. He has 30 years experience with masonry engineering, including special expertise with non-destructive evaluation and repair procedures. His 100 publications on concrete and masonry include a new book titled Assessment and Retrofit of Masonry Structures, and he taught masonry structural design at the University of Colorado from 1999 through 2009 and in 2016. Mr. Schuler serves on the board of directors of the Rocky Mountain Masonry Institute, and the Masonry Society and is a fellow of the Masonry Society and the Association for Preservation Technology. And lastly, based in Portland, Oregon, Maya Fodi's experience includes numerous preservation projects on both the East and West Coasts. 
She has worked in both the public and private sectors and has taken large, several large projects through the design, permitting, and construction phases. With a passion for historic buildings, Maya has extensive experience in historic documentation, building condition surveys, construction document production, and construction management. Maya is the vice chair of the Portland Historic Landmark Commission and provides leadership and expertise on maintaining and enhancing Portland's historic and architectural heritage. So as you see, we're in very good company here with all the accomplishments that all of our speakers have today. And without further ado, I will hand things over to Dan to kick us off. Thanks so much, Nick. My name is Dan Say with Smith and Say Paget Structural Engineers, and let's talk about unreinforced masonry buildings, shall we? So why do we do seismic retrofits? Well, there's three primary reasons, but one very important one, and that is the safety of building occupants. There's also survivability of, of the structure and functionality of the structure. So let's take a look at an existing building, an elevation of a 1910, circa 1910 Bellingham Armory, unreinforced masonry structure. I have an architectural elevation and a section. I show this just to illustrate that unreinforced masonry buildings, there's, there's no typical one. They're all different and they're all beautiful. So let's talk about the makeup of a unreinforced masonry or URM structure. Typically, we have an exterior brick, hand-placed brick wall, often with a parapet, usually with a decorative cap, a decorative cornice, decorative sills, but the makeup of the roof structure is a generally heavy timber structure with a straight decking. Uh, the floor structure is also often heavy timber, and if you notice here, there's a diagonal cut in there, kind of a fire cut, that is a, is a typical sort of construction technique that allows the, the framing member, if it were to catch fire or rot, to rotate out of the wall such that it wouldn't tear the wall apart. So uh, it's, it, it's a very unique sort of to URM structures. Let's look at some typical URM buildings. Um, in my neighborhood, Belltown in Seattle, this is the Palace Ballroom. I mean, the thing about URM structures is that you probably see dozens of them a day and you really don't even know that they're there. They're, they're very part of the fabric of our city. Uh, often they're in residential uses such as this one at 4th and Bell. Uh, also uh, another, another structure, the Castle Apartments right by my office, uh, another six story unreinforced masonry residential structure. But they can also be in business districts. This is a city club building tucked right between two existing buildings also in the olympic block neighborhood um, what's interesting about this is that while this looks like the top is a very heavy cornice it's actually light gauge metal so they can be deceiving sometimes uh, this is a historic liberty theater in walla walla that i visited just recently um, hard to tell this is a urm but it certainly certainly is and it's also hollow clay tile on the back side um, public structures such as the West Seattle Library, Historic Carnegie. Um, this is the JM building in Pioneer Square. I, I point this out for one reason. My grandfather used to hang out in the card room in the back and drink whiskey in the 1900s. But other than that, it's a project that I had worked have been working on and I'm very um, uh, familiar with. If you're a Seahawks fan, you often go, a lot of people go into that bar and, and hang out, but it's a it's a beautiful, iconic building. Uh, the Loman Hanford building, which is um, a building wedged again between two existing buildings, is a very interesting structure in that there are no columns in the building. The, the floor joists span from wall to wall. The exterior walls are up to four feet thick at the lower levels and thin up, so to speak, to about 18 to 24 inches as you go above that. Uh, the original Rainier Brewery in uh, Georgetown, the the stock house shown here is just a facade. The building behind it burned and it's, and it's braced and preserved this sort of historic fabric on the outside. This structure here is the old ice house, was the old ice house. It's now a Franz chocolate facility. Interesting story about that is that this ice house actually froze, there was earth, earth, frozen earth that created this big ice ball underneath the building, which actually pushed the columns up and pulled the walls in. So when this was decommissioned, our concern was that the, uh, the melting of that ice ball would pull the walls in, the building would collapse. While we don't like the demo buildings, this one unfortunately had to, had to go. 
a little bit about interesting aspects of URMs. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they are common wall buildings. This looks like a parking lot, and it is. But as you can see from the exterior walls, that there's these little grouted in pockets. Well, there was a structure there that spanned from wall to wall. So it basically had, it was borrowing the walls of the adjacent neighboring buildings to build its structure. So when is a retrofit required? Well, with the, in the city of Seattle, there are definitions or you know, a series of definitions used to trigger what's called a substantial alteration. Uh, damage ratio to the building of more than 60%, say from earthquake or uh, wind, uh, fire. If you extend the useful life economic life of the structure, if you change the occupancy of the structure to a higher risk category, if the building's been vacant for more than 24 months, or if for the case of an unreinforced masonry building, if there's an increase in occupant load. That's City of Seattle. Other jurisdictions use similar methods, and they often use the IEBC, which is the International Existing Building Code, as their reference document. So let's talk about building codes. The, Starting in February of 2021, at least in the city of Seattle, the state of Washington, we will be using the International Existing Building Code 2018 edition and ASCE 4117, which is the most current methodology to evaluate existing buildings. Um, what's interesting to note about this is that with these new codes, we have much higher seismic forces, uh, which will make, um, make designing existing buildings more complex, uh, but you need a good engineer to figure out how to do that. Uh, let's talk about post-earthquake performance expectations. Um, we look at several categories of or, uh, performance expectations for buildings. The, the, the collapse prevention performance level is the, the lowest category. What that means is there are damaged components to the building. There is no margin against collapse. So basically the occupants can, can escape the building, but the building may need to be reconstructed. The next basic level would be the life safety performance level, S3, which means that there are damaged components to the building. There is a margin of safety against collapse, but not a large one, but there is one. And between those two is what's called reduced or limited safety, S4. Um, the most stringent category would be the immediate occupancy performance level, S1. What that means is the building is safe to occupy and it maintains its original strength and stiffness prior to, prior to the earthquake. So damp and then damage control is immediately between both of those levels. So regarding forces, the, we, we design buildings based on, on um, types of earthquake performance. So for existing buildings, we use what's called a BS1E earthquake, which is a 20% probability in exceed of exceedance in 50 years, or BSE2E, which is a 5% probability of exceedance in 50 years. What that basically tells you is the return period for the BS1E uh, is 250 years. The BSE2E is 1,000 years. Now, if you compare that to current buildings, current building codes, are, it's, the design is based on a 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years or a 2,500 year event. That's the return period of the earthquake. The, the longer the return period, the higher the forces. We design buildings in existing buildings using earthquake forces that are lower than the current building code. And I think that's really important that we understand that. We're not designing to current codes, we're designing to a lower code. There are risk categories for each of, uh, of, of building types too, conveniently called categories one, two, three, and four. The um, risk category one is a, would be a generally unoccupied structure like a, a potato storage building in Royal City, Washington, for example. Uh, risk category two would be a residential, commercial, industrial project, a very typical uh, building type that we commonly use and commonly uh, address uh, retrofits on. Risk category three would be a building that houses a large number of people like theaters and lecture halls and schools and prisons. And then finally, risk category four is in a, would be sort of an essential facility, one like a 9-11 facility or hospitals or police or emergency communications facilities. So once you know, you have your building type, once you know your risk category and, and you then move into like 
to our, our next level, which would be the tiers of, of our study. So there's tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is an initial screening procedure that utilizes the basic configuration checklist. There are checklists for every most every building type. And basically there's a compliant or non-compliant column. So you walk through the building, you use this checklist, decide whether it's compliant or non-compliant. This is generally the first step in our seismic evaluation process. The results of this report will be used to determine the next steps of retrofit. And it's usually what we like to provide to the building department to have a discussion as to what the scope would be. We then generally move on to tier two, which is a deficiency-based retrofit. The items that are not compliant in our tier one screening are then uh, dealt with in our tier two assessment. Tier three, we're not gonna really go into that today, but that's a special uh, uh, triggered requirement in the building code, uh, often based on uh, risk categories and other things. Uh, it's a very robust and very complex analysis. But tier one and tier two is typically what we do for most of our URM structures. We then move, use the, the rest of the building code to actually uh, do our strengthening and evaluations for the masonry components of the building using the masonry procedures in that chapter and the international existing building code special procedures. There is a special procedure in ASC 4117 as well, but it's tough to follow. The process of our typical repairs uh, include the production of a seismic report, usually our ASC 4117 tier one assessment. We meet with the building department at a pre, uh, pre-conference or pre-submittal conference to discuss scope and negotiate this seismic mitigation scope. Generally, we end up going with a tier two uh, assessment or, or retrofit. We do non-destructive and destructive investigations to determine conditions and material testing. Michael will talk more about that. Uh, we also use utilize historic resources and photos, which can be very, very helpful to us. So we were often frustrated um, as a firm trying to uh, read existing drawings from the microfiche. They're, the quality of the, of the copies provided to us by the building departments were not good. And what use are these drawings if you don't have the ability to actually read them? So we devised one of our engineers, a little shout out to Derek Olgren that actually built this, um, is a, we built this little contraption here that's basically a high resolution digital camera. We mounted on this frame and then have a place that, uh, a mounting bracket that actually holds the microfiche. We actually take photographs of these microfiche um, slides and then to create uh, PDF documents from those. And they're very, very high resolution. They're very, very helpful to us. So we carry this to the building apartment. We look kind of strange walking in there with a big suitcase, but that's what we do. Um, so before we get into the seismic repairs, let's talk about some common problems with exterior brick masonry. Often we'll see problems that you see here, which is a, the detachment and flaking off of the brick on the outside. Often that's the result of improper mortar uh, use. We don't want to have masonry cement in our mortar. We need a type O or type OA mortar to allow the free water to get out of the masonry joint rather than through the face of the brick, which will cause this sort of damage. We don't like that. Uh, other problems that we see in exterior URM buildings are is a problem called rust jacking, where ex any existing steel gets exposed to water and rust and can, can grow to many, many times its thickness. Uh, so with this, this these gaps that you see allow additional water to come in, freeze thaw problems. So it's a it's a difficulty, and we try to avoid that. There's another example of it. Also, failing to to repoint and prepare the exterior of the building, you'll result in some significant damage. Um, because URM buildings are heavy, we often see differential settlement where one wall will move down versus the other one side. Here's an example of a building in Waitsburg that I looked at just recently. This has been grouted up at the top, but there's a large gap at the top. The top of the building moves, it stretches, and the bottom, the end of the building drops down, creating this crack at the top. Um, so we need to repair those so that water doesn't enter and cause the freeze thaw problem that is, can often be the case. So typical retrofit solutions, you know, basically about 75% of the, the weight of the building of URMs is in the exterior walls. And since seismic forces are based on on uh, elevated mass, 
clearly the walls are an issue. So improve for us, we try to control building movement and, and anchor the building components together. To control building movement, we often put a, a plywood overlay on top of the existing roof to stiffen the roof to keep the move, roof from moving around too much. We brace the roof parapets by putting angle brackets or some sort of system up there to keep the parapet from toppling over because it's not reinforced. Uh, we tie the exterior floors to the exterior walls. That, that provides us with assurance that the, both of these systems will go together. If the wall moves horizontally and the floor doesn't go with it, the floor will collapse. We provide secondary support columns, often at locations of heavy load, um, not shown in this drawing, but we will show those later. Um, then there's a full global lateral system, which is really the introduction of a new lateral uh, system. Here's some examples of some typical parapet bracing, a, a little rendering that we drew here, and then examples shown in these three spots. The one up the lower right is, is an example where we can't have the diagonal strut because it's an occupied roof, so we developed a tube steel L-shaped bracket. Uh, with some of these, we often put uh, wood framing in lieu of the steel members, uh, and there, those are continuous. The reason being, as you can see here, there are pitch pockets associated with those diagonal struts, and those can often be leakers. Uh, out of plane anchorage with floors running parallel. These are these are condition. This is a condition where the the joists are running perpendicular to the wall. Um, here's a secondary support column. Um, this is really not. This is a not truly a secondary support column, but I wanted to show you what it looked like. This actually is the secondary support column. Um, those are those are placed on the inside face of the wall to allow vertical support of the of the primary member down through the building. Common design solutions include um, braced frames. This is a braced frame. This is a 419 Occidental, the FX McCrory space. It's a Super X that runs up this way and carries up through the building like that. Uh, th they're very, uh, it's a very common approach. Here's a shot inside the building looking out. One of the interesting things to note about um, braced, braced frames is that since you need to place it on the inside face of the wall and, and as the walls get thinner as you go up, you're often going to be uh, the existing or the new braces are going to be pushed inboard of the exterior wall as you go up the building. So you have to consider that in your detailing. I like this shot. It shows the CLT roof that we have and, and along with our, the top of our braced frame. This again is still 419. There are buckling restrained braces also that are a proprietary system designed to allow the building to withstand the cyclic loading. Um, we use those um, and we did use this on the, um, the Loman Hanford project that we talked about earlier with the big thick walls. It just worked out well. You see no columns. The only columns in that building are, are, are our um, buckling restrained braces. So why do we do all this? Well, <laughs> Clearly, if you're standing underneath this building, and then this is our textbook example of a damaged building during the Nisqually earthquake here at the Cadillac Hotel. We try to save lives. Saving lives are really what this is all about, but saving buildings too. But this, this Nisqually earthquake shows how much damage a, an earthquake can cause. Um, the Christchurch earthquake in 2011, see the roof collapsing down and the exterior walls falling out. And then the Napa earthquake in 2014. So with that, I would like to uh, sign off and move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, those are some great projects that you showed. And you know, I just wanted to also point out that you know, because <clears throat> we had planned this session to be in Seattle, you know, it was obviously going to be heavily focused on um, a lot of the professionals and the work that we've done up in the Pacific Northwest here. But a lot of the concepts, um, you know, and projects that Dan is bringing up, and also the things that you'll see from Michael and and Maya later on, um, are are important to you know be able to apply to other areas of the country too. Uh, we know that there are high seismic risks all up and down the West Coast, but as many of you know, there are also pockets of um, seismic vulnerabilities um, all over the country. You know, in the Mid Atlantic states. Uh, there's some, um, there's a little pocket in Southeast Missouri, uh, a little bit in Oklahoma as well. And also just, uh, you know, for some of the um, <clears throat> more rural projects that you saw Dan present um, with unreinforced masonry in general, uh, especially in regards to maintenance and upkeep, 
these are problems that we have with unreinforced masonry buildings anywhere because you can find an unreinforced masonry building that's going to have lateral forces acting against it either with high winds or uh, with a little bit of seismic activity or you know those caused by human-made ground disturbances but it's important to know that there's a range of approaches that you have to take into consideration when it comes to evaluating versus program and code requirements for a particular project. So thank you, Dan, for all of your wisdom. Um, so we're moving on now, um, and I will hand it over to Michael to continue our presentation. And again, just to remind you, if you have any questions, um, for any of our speakers to use the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer them in the Q&A or live. Well, okay, thanks, Nick. Thank you, Dan, also. And uh, I trust that that sound and, and uh, you can is good. You can see my screen, everything okay? Right. So um, we're gonna Everything's talk good. about how you get information on, on building construction and material properties to guide your seismic retrofit design. And, you know, you have an unreinforced masonry building. Let's see what the International Existing Building Code and ASCE 41 tell us we're required to do, but also look at some uh, uh, typical methods that are used for understanding as-built conditions, uh, looking for deterioration, distress, and, and very importantly, uh, getting material properties, shear strength, compressive strength, hugely important for uh, our analysis and design when we're confronted with a seismic retrofit. So the IEBC 2018 version, you turn to Appendix Chapter A1, those are seismic strengthening provisions for unreinforced masonry buildings. And AS, uh, or sorry, the IEBC tells us that uh, you're required to, to carry out a condition survey and looking for masonry that's in either good condition, uh, good condition being defined as, as free of any degraded mortar, free of degraded masonry units, or significant cracking. And I, I put significant in quotes because the IEBC does not do a great job of telling us what a significant crack is. Well, we'll get into that a little more with ASCE 41. And, and the implications are, if, if your condition survey returns a, a masonry that's not in good condition, that masonry has to be repaired, retrofit, strengthened, or, or torn out and rebuilt uh, as part of the, the seismic strengthening program. So, you know, we're just looking at some photos here of masonry in pretty decent condition on the top and, and clearly on the bottom where, where we've lost some face units, so not in good condition. Testing, the IEBC talks about two different types of testing. The first is shear testing, understanding the shear capacity of our masonry construction. And uh, this, this uh, uh, lateral shear test, some people call it the shove test, is standardized in ASTM C1531. And, and it's required for every, every one of our seismic uh, upgrade projects. And straightforward little test, uh, here on the right, we've got a hydraulic ram that's, that's put into the wall. You take a brick out for that ram and you physically push a brick sideways. You know, apply a force to the end, shearing those mortar joints top and bottom. And on the left, that same test, just using a, a little flat jack inserted into a mortar head joint for loading the brick. How does this work for us? Why does this work for us? Well, the IEBC actually has a method to take the results of those tests and correlate that to overall shear strength of the wall. And I like this, this thought because if, if you have a shear lateral force applied to the top of your wall, it we give zero tensile strength to the mortar and the head joint. So that, that means that our Wall shear strength is just really the summation of all these little bed joint sliding surfaces. And, and it makes sense. And, and the correlation is pretty good. It's not perfect, but, but there is a method there in the IEBC for taking results of those shear tests and getting a, a, an in-plane shear strength of our wall. And uh, if you've been involved in seismic retrofit projects, you've seen those tests and, and there are an awful lot of those tests that are required following the building code, the IEBC. Uh, that tells us that uh, we're required to conduct two of those in-place shear tests at the first and top stories for every wall and every line of wall elements, eight tests minimum per building, uh, yeah, one test for other stories, intermediate stories, so um, all sorts of tests. And it's not uncommon to have 20 to 30 or maybe even more in-place shear tests in, in uh, as part of your seismic retrofit project. IEBC also talks about testing anchors, tension anchors. 
and following ASTM E488, which uh, if, if you purchase a current version of E488, there is no Mason Hanker test in there. We're working with ASTM. They have a new standard that is, uh, I, it's either out or just about ready to be published for testing masonry anchors. But uh, bottom line is uh, you're required to test a number of, of existing tension anchors and new anchors as well, just to verify more proof tests than anything else, just verify that the capacity you get out of those anchors is adequate. Um, ASCE 41 ha has a, quite a bit more in, in, in different chapters, in the masonry chapter, in the planning chapters on your evaluation and, and how you get material conditions, material properties. So uh, 2017 version of ASCE 41 right up there in chapter one talks about what your role is as a designer in the seismic evaluation process. You are required to carry out a site vision. Makes sense, right? You've got to get on site, look at the materials, how the building was built, and put together a report on uh, that describes the condition of the building. The first step in your uh, seismic evaluation really is, is, is looking for as-built information. So you're down in the building department, you're down in the archives, in the basement or where, wherever the, you know, the archives are for your building, looking for construction drawings, construction specs, any inspection reports, uh, maintenance records, all that information helps you set up your condition survey. So a very important part of your project is looking for that, uh, that information and, and conducting some historic research. And uh, so, so you have some idea of how a building was supposed to be built. Sometimes those drawings exist, sometimes they don't. In any case, you, you head out on site and, and supplement what those drawings are telling you uh, uh, with on-site investigations. And that's going to include visual observations, uh, depending on your level of investigation, some non-destructive testing, and, and probably some, some in-situ testing or, or lab testing of your materials. And you know, when I send people out on condition assessments, I always think about the information uh, that we're looking for as, as falling into one of three different classifications. You need to know how the building's built. Okay, what are the wall thicknesses? What are our connections? And, and when I say connections, you're probably thinking, all right, uh, wall the floored up connections, wall the diaphragm connections, those wall anchors. And that's important. But, but also remember with masonry, we have typically multiple layers of brick or stone throughout our wall thickness. So we're looking for connections within the thickness of the wall as well. They may be metal with modern buildings, but more typically, like as we see here on the right, the stone masonry construction, we're looking for bond stones. We're looking for brick header courses. And these are these, these thicker stone elements that overlap our stones above and below that provide some level of connection in our, in our wall thickness. So as-built conditions, we're also looking for inter, uh, current conditions that could be deterioration, cracking, distress, and very importantly, engineering properties. What's the strength of our materials? What is our stiffness that we use for design? So ASCE 41 actually gives us in chapter three some, some nice guidance on the type of information you need to come out of your condition survey with. Uh, building configuration, maybe just as importantly, um, identifying building components. What are your shear walls? Track your load paths, both vertically and for vertical loads and lateral loads. Uh, looking at adjacent buildings, what our building components are. Um, it also tells you to look for bulging and leaning walls. Why is that important? Well, and it, it bulge or lean in our walls implies some type of movement. Uh, most masons are out on site with a level or a plumb bob, whatever, back in the day. And they did a pretty good job of, of reasonably building their walls vertical. And so this little example I'm showing here is actually tracking um, plumbness of our wall over, over its height. This is the back wall of this building. And um, the important concept here is not, not just looking for leaning walls and bulging, but, but looking at both faces. Um, in this example, this uh, uh, the lighter blue line is the exterior wall face at that uh, bulging inward then back out and uh, for some reason the inside face there is is deflecting quite a bit more and what that tells me is that we have about a two inch separation opening up there between our uh, our y's that's a bad thing 
And we don't like those types of separation and something that will need to be repaired. Now, ASCE 401 also gives you a little bit of a reward for conducting more investigative efforts and not gonna get into this table uh, in, in detail. Uh, I'll sign it for homework. You can look at this tonight, uh, table 6-1. The important thing for our discussion here is this knowledge factor down on the bottom. And essentially this is a reduction on your material properties that you use for design purposes. If you do more investigative work, you get to use 100% of your properties. Less investigative work, you take a 10% or 25% hit. Um, that knowledge factor, that kappa factor shows up in our um, uh, component evaluation process. So condition assessment is required and part of your job is to classify masonry as being good, fair or poor condition. The implication again being if it's in poor condition, just like with the IEBC, you have to repair walls before you can consider it as part of your primary or secondary structural system. Okay. And, um, you know, there the, are the a couple funny statements in there. What's minor cracking? Fair can have minor cracking, uh, poor significant cracking. ASCE 41 defines minor cracking as cracks less than 1 16th of an inch. On the right, we see a photograph with some significant cracks. Okay, so that I would classify as poor condition. I think the, uh, you know, there's some judgment involved here. You look at the top photo where we've lost faces of brick. Is that fair condition or poor? Certainly some pockets of poor condition in there, but overall I think that's probably right on the border between fair and poor, but that's okay. We should be fixing some broken units like that. Our on-site investigations, if you fall in the comprehensive condition assessment category, that means you will be carrying out some non-destructive tests. And there's actually some pretty good guidance in ASCE 41 about what tests are available to us, pulse velocity, impact echo and radiography used for looking at reinforced masonry. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of our favorite techniques, things that we use on a lot of projects. And for example, microwave radar, surface penetrating radar. So uh, radar antenna is, is shooting out thousands of microwave signals every second. And so as that antenna is rolled up the surface of the stone wall, we see a, a signal or a trace being uh, recorded on the right on the little screen there and all these funny little reflections these little lines in here is the back of our wall um, I see some real strong reflections in here and here and here is telling us uh, information about internal wall condition and stone thickness so very nicely telling us the thickness of our masonry elements and I think usually what we're after really is looking at radar traces uh, to get an idea of wall thickness, wall solidity, do we have rubble fill, where are our header courses, and two fine examples here of radar traces. Um, on the left, very clean trace, we get a, a, a strong reflection from the back of the wall, uh, but no reflection in between, so solid construction, and contrast this with the signal on the right with some very uh, clear linear patterns here, the back of our wall down here, lots of internal voids and separations, and this wall was actually built with about an inch and a half cavity space between the inner brick layer or white and, and, and the main mass of the wall. So uh, radar investigation is good for looking at internal voids and there are uh, maybe advanced techniques that can actually map out those voids and, and uh, these uh, post-processing software efforts uh, here, here mapping out voids behind a, a stone facing part of the seismic effort in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, some rather large voids developed over the last 300 years as material behind this wall is washed out by wave action and, and, and rainwater. So, so radar is a, a very powerful method for looking at internal conditions. Another good method, infrared thermography, uh, infrared cameras just measure heat radiating off of, of the surfaces, uh, highly precise, highly accurate, one-tenth of a degree C resolution. And the concept is that you know, if you have heat moving through or, or heat energy moving through a wall, any kind of internal discontinuity, discontinuity interrupts that heat transfer. And that shows up as a pattern at the face of the wall. One of the best things about infrared is that it is close to a global technique as we have. Um, just a 
one snapshot can capture an entire building elevation. You don't need scaffold. Um, current uh, seismic retrofit project we have uh, for Adobe construction down in Arizona is here, and all these little cool zones on a relatively cool morning are showing us spots where the external facing of the wall is separated from the interior, and that, that could be a plaster lamination, could be an interior void. I don't know which, but I know I need to go back to those areas and, and get some additional information about interior wall construction. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, some surprises uh, jump out at you. And here on the, the infrared image on the left, it was a cold exterior day, warm heat on the inside. And uh, so you see these the, the funny cold zone at the top, this hot zone at the bottom, middle of this wall, and, and uh, very clearly outlining. Go to the inside, you know, there are some fire boxes. And, and I was really excited about this one because we we're actually picking up this kind of a diagonal pattern of the flu um, internally to the wall. So this type of information, hugely important for helping you understand your uh, uh, lateral load resistance mechanisms, where your walls are, um, and how those walls are broken up by internal features. A couple other things we look at um, are metal detection, looking for if there's any reinforcement, any veneer anchors, any types of um, stone crams, very effective little scanning devices for looking at any type of metal, not just conductive metal, but lead, copper, uh, any any type of um, um, non-magnetic metals as well. Boroscopes, videoscopes. Oh, there's my five minutes. That's okay. We're on track. Um, boroscopes, videoscopes, also hugely useful. Uh, and, and not not taking the places of probes altogether, but but drilling a small hole into a mortar joint can get you nice information on. Uh, internal metals, and and you know, if, you, if you detect a space inside your wall with a radar or infrared, uh, it's always a good idea to drill in and take a look. We see on the right, um, you know, a, a chimney flue, void collar joints, and uh, on the bottom, nice previous retrofit effort. Yeah, a helical anchor that's that's passing through a uh, uh, in a chimney flue in this case. So condition, uh, non-destructive tests are great, but they don't tell us really anything uh, conclusive about our material properties. So we have to turn to different different types of test methods to understand shear strength. We talked about that already, talked a little bit about anchors, um, bond strength. There's an in-situ bond wrench test here, this, this photo here. Um, but let's concentrate on compressive strength and the time we have left. Um, Couple different ways to get compressive strength of your materials. For modern masonry, it, it's perfectly fine to use uh, the Masonry Society code and specifications, TMS 602, the unit strength tables in there. For older masonry, you have a couple different options. Um, on the left, you can certainly cut out prisms from a wall and get those back to the lab in one piece somehow or other. It's not an easy task and it can be expensive, but test those in compression. Um, precisely one time in the last 25 years, we've actually fabricated prisms to represent in-place construction. This is for stone masonry where we just couldn't get samples out of the wall, couldn't figure out a good way to test in place. Uh, and so ASCE 41 allows you to fabricate prisms, analyzing the mortar so you know the mortar type, analyzing the materials and testing the materials so you know the, 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 the brick materials, or in this case stone, and fabricating test samples in the lab for testing and compression. Another way you can get compressive strength and material properties following ASC 41 are going into one of their default lower bound unreinforced masonry strength tables, table 11-2A for what I think is more modern masonry um, that's based on a type N, fairly, you know, fairly competent modern mortar, Portland cement lime, and, and using the values in, in, in that table. Uh, new to ASCE 41 in the 2017 version is, is this table on the right, table 11-2C um, for lime mortar built masonry. And these are very low compressive strength values, very low flexural tensile strength values, but you know, the, these are reasonable lower bound values. Um, Lime mortar, how do you identify lime mortar? Well, you run tests. And uh, if you can scrape the mortar by hand out of the joint with a metal tool, then that's a lime mortar. 
the final way to look for strength in situ is using flat jacks. And flat jacks are, are little hydraulic pressure cells made very thin to fit into mortar joints. And there's an ASTM test for in-place testing of masonry using the flat jack method. You see here ASTM C 1197. Pretty interesting test. Two flat jacks are placed in, in, in slots cut into mortar joints, instrumentation placed on the face of the wall and uh, to measure surface strains as the wall's being compressed. And, and you get a nice stress strain curve out of the method. Um, so flat jack method is the third way to, to get our, our compressive strength. So I'm gonna finish with a couple thoughts about the number of tests that ASCE 41 requires. Remember that table 6-1, you might have noticed there are usual testing requirements and comprehensive testing requirements. Um, for usual testing, kind of like the IEBC, two tests per wall or line of wall elements at the top and bottom stories, one test at other inner, inner story walls, no fewer than one test per 1500 square feet and eight tests total. Comprehensive testing, well, more tests, uh, three tests per UMR, URM class. If you have fair mas condition masonry, good condition masonry, test each of those. And for every three floors, 3,000 square feet of wall, there are requirements. Um, you can read up on this section 11.2.3.9, minimum eight tests per building. And more tests if, if you have a lot of variation in your results. So pretty quickly, you can run into a whole series of tests for to look at your um, compression strength, shear strength, and all the rest. So that's it, a nice little 20 minute summary of what, what we were looking at with the IEBC and ASCE 41. I really appreciate your time and time to move on to the next, next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and it's great that you were able to compress all of that information in 20 minutes because I know you could teach an entire semester's worth, I'm pretty sure, on this on just this topic alone. So oh, definitely okay. appreciate your um your, the amount of information that you were uh, able to cram into such a short amount of time. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in from the audience uh, as we get everything transitioned over to Maya. Uh, first question came in uh, was in regards to the shear tests that you uh, were showing in the beginning of your um, presentation. And is there a similar application for a shear test for a historic concrete building as opposed to an unreinforced masonry building? Yeah, well, there, there, there's no shove test analogy, no shear test analogy for concrete. I think one thing I didn't talk about, there is a, um, a diametral core test that you can also use for looking at masonry shear strength. So you take out a, a fairly large core, six inch or eight inch diameter, and put that in a compression testing machine with the uh, intersection of a head joint and a bed joint at the center of that core. And, and that gives you the splitting tensile strength of your of your masonry and that's related back then to shear strength so uh, perhaps a, a similar method for concrete would also be applicable so taking a core out looking at the uh, tension splitting strength and relating that back to shear strength great uh so not as non-destructive but definitely something yeah. that is minimally destructive less yeah. than taking out the entire wall <laughs> mm -hmm. um the uh the other question we had come came in um is what is the difference between SPR and GPR? Well, no difference really. Um, I like to use SPR, surface penetrating radar, when we're looking at walls and buildings, when we're not looking in the ground. Ground penetrating radar, um, you know, used for archaeology and other purposes, same concept, different frequency antenna. So um, when you're looking in the ground, you're using a very low frequency antenna to penetrate deeply into the soil. And the, the, the downside of that, these lower frequencies, you're not able to resolve small features or features small than, I don't know, four or six inches across. Uh, we'll use higher frequencies looking at walls because we get better resolution and we don't need to get feet, you know, several uh, meters, say, in, into a wall. We're looking at 12, 16, 24 inch thick walls. So same concept, different frequency antenna may or may not be the same equipment. It certainly is a non-destructive testing methodology. It's fairly easily accessible and and definitely encouraged, uh, depending on the application. Yeah. yeah, and there are a lot of people, a lot of firms that are using, uh, you know, buying this equipment, using it. And my only caveat, my my um, 
advice to the listeners is that if you have a masonry building, make sure that the people you get involved have looked at masonry before because it's uh, concrete, very, very different, somewhat easier to interpret radar images in concrete uh, when compared to, say, masonry, very, very difficult to look at radar traces of masonry sometimes. Some sage advice. And the same goes both ways. You have uh, somebody that isn't necessarily an expert in concrete um, construction um, that has a lot of experience in masonry might not necessarily have the same uh, experience necessary to fully evaluate. So always good to have the right experts in the room. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we will uh, now hand it over to Maya, unless you had any other uh, thoughts, Mike. Uh, no, that's it. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Nick. All right. Uh, so we'll hand it over to Maya now. Wonderful. You can hear me and see my screen. Sure can. Wonderful. Okay. Nice to um, have everybody here today. Thank you for those presentations, Michael and Dan. Um, I'm going to be presenting some projects that are the the you know, end result of the extensive work and testing of the structural engineers. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the testing. I'll touch on some of it. Um, and I specifically focused on a couple of uh, historic, sensitive historic buildings and uh, slightly different uh, structural upgrade methods, including um, FRP, center pouring, and phase isolation. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, a quick overview of Architectural Resources Group. Um, we were founded in 1980. It's one of the first architectural firms focusing on preserving the West Coast's rich built heritage. We have a staff of about 50 people in three offices, including preservation architects, planners, and material conservators. The first project I'm going to talk about um, is one of our projects um, at the Presidio. Um, Rob Thompson actually touched on this, uh, these projects last week uh, on, at his presentation. The structural engineer um, was home structures. Um, uh, so the Facing the Presidio of San Francisco's main parade ground, Building 105 is the northernmost in a series of five identical barracks buildings constructed in the 1890s. The Presidio is a National Historical Landmark District, um, north end of San Francisco, and one of the most ambitious historic preservation projects underway in the US because it has 6 million square feet of built space for which nearly 3.3 million square feet have been rehabilitated, rehabilitated to date. As a result, Presidio building projects like the Lodge, which is this one, have been uh, adhered to the high standards of historic rehabilitation set by the Secretary of the Interior. Building 105 was also designed to meet lead gold. Um, so uh, we, the home structures actually had developed uh, this seismic upgrade solution after having worked on several other barracks buildings um, so we're very lucky to have already had this approach to develop on um, other buildings. Um, and essentially, after um, evaluating many structural possibilities through performance-based engineering, um, they determined that the application of lightweight glass and carbon fiber reinforced polymer would provide the necessary strengthening of the existing unreinforced brick masonry walls. The retrofit was performed following the requirements in the 2012 IEBC or 75% of current code forces. Um, as an aside, Holmes had actually developed their own modeling program to be able to do this. FRP elements were used as hold downs, preventing the piers from rocking and fully utilizing the existing bricks shear capacity. This option proved more economical and minimized the impact on original features. The solution captured the inherent strength of the existing building fabric, as well as the energy dissipation associated with the flexible wood diagrams. Here's a, a diagram, essentially a wall section. I'll, I'll show you uh, floor plans in a second as to where these were located. But uh, it was a, a combination of uh, shear walls, brace frame, and, and uh, a brace frame. And you can actually see here what this actually looked like, this uh, FRP basically is embedded in epoxy and strategically bolted into the walls um, and is was used in association with other seismic upgrade elements. So this actually is a section through the walls and it gives you an example of what this looked like um, in elevation. So through the buildings, this is where we had these FRP sheets laid into the wall and connected to the structure. Um, so after the uh, FRP elements were installed, lap was patched, creating no visible differences after the interior finish is repaired. Alternate schemes such as shotcrete 
would have required an excessive removal and loss of the interior historic fabric. And actually an additional eight inches of concrete would likely have been applied to the interior surface of the brick wall, changing the interior dimension and altering the quality of life and window openings. From a sustainability standpoint, this FRP approach reduced the embodied energy of construction materials for the project by 25% through the retention of original materials and minimized use of new uh, materials. And here's, uh, this is the first floor plan. And, and essentially what we have here are the concrete shear wall here. We have a, the structural brace frame K is here. This was a constructability issue. We needed to get it in behind the elevator. And so that's why the steel uh, brace frame was used. And then these red lines essentially show you exactly where the FRP was placed um, along the exterior walls. The, this is um, the second floor. And so you can see the shear walls coming up and you can see the FRP along the exterior walls. Um, this is the the foundation, the basement level, basically, and you can really see there, the the shear walls really were applied around the perimeter um, of the the basement, and then FRP was used um, at the columns. So this is a, a final image of one of the guest rooms, and this really shows um, what a difference it makes not to have the added eight inches of a shear wall. Um, and we could keep all of this, um, the historic trim. The, the next project I'm gonna talk about, now this is a concrete building, but um, it was such an interesting use of FRP. I, I thought I'd, I'd include it. And since one of the other um, attendees had asked a question about concrete, hopefully this will be well received. Um, so this project, um, it's the Alcatraz Quartermaster House. The structural engineer um, was URS now they've, um, under AECOM. The project is a concrete structure, but the FRP strategies were interesting. So the Alcatraz prison is one of the most famous penal facilities in the world, constructed in 1909 as a military prison, became a maximum security federal prison in the 1930s. In 1986, Alcatraz Island became a national historic landmark. Originally constructed by the US Army in 1921, the Quartermaster Warehouse, so this one, as a reinforced concrete structure used for storage, workshop, and office space owned by the Park Service, this project was funded by the Golden Gate National Park Conservancy. Um, the building remains in use as a storage and workshop space, but the hostile marine environment of San Francisco Bay has taken a significant hold in the structure. ARG served as an architect for the seismic retrofit and rehabilitation of the building, which also included substantial envelope repairs, window restoration, and, and a new roof. Um, Uh, this is an image in 2010. Deterioration was visible at all, nearly all concrete elements, including large spalls. Um, and you could see the um, corroded reinforcing steel at the walls, beams, columns, and floor slabs. Deterioration was most severe at the exterior walls, but also visible throughout the interior. In many cases, rebar was observed very close to the surface cracks and spalls. The building's main uh, lateral forcing force resisting system was retrofitted according to the seismic demands outlined in the 2010 California Historical Building Code, which prescribes that seismic design forces used to evaluate the structure need not exceed 0.75 times the seismic forces prescribed by the 1995 edition of the California Building Code. One of the reasons FRP was used as a seismic repair strategy um, in this location because it's on an island and it, because the, it would have been very expensive to try to bring concrete out here. So there's a lot of effort made to see how we could use FRP uh, as much as possible. So here's, uh, so um, FRP was used for the repair of the cold joint, floor strengthening and connecting the four walls. The quartermaster warehouse was constructed using army prison labor and the building's original craftsmanship was accordingly low in quality. During demolition of the damaged concrete and parts coat, it was discovered that the four building stories had been poured in separate lifts and were not structurally connected to each other. You can see that here. The discovery of these cold joints required the modification of repair details, including the addition of FRP reinforcement at each horizontal joint. The FRP was ultimately concealed behind a new parch coat, allow, uh, allowing for the repair without any visual changes to the historic facade. So this is an idea. You can see the FRP embedded in epoxy, and in some cases, like mentioned before, bolted into the walls. This is an image of the FRP, which was placed underneath the roof eaves 
along the upper perimeter of the building to stitch together the four walls. Here at the floor slabs, um, this application was used to strengthen the floor slabs. You can see this here. So these are called super anchors. And the super anchors were used to connect the floor to the beam. Otherwise, um, they would have had to actually pour a whole new concrete slab to reinforce the floors. Um, shot crease was also used. Um, I don't have any images of that, but they were used in conjunction with this uh, method. Um, here's an image of um, the finished product of what that looked like. You can actually see that it's vin minimally visible once it's painted. And it was also used selectively um, at the top portions of the building. I should say that one of the reasons uh, it was the, well, the decision was made to put on the other side of the floor slabs is because the top of the floor slabs, not in this image so much, there are walls and other things in, in, in the way and we would have had to demolish walls to install the FRP. So the decision was to made to put it on the underside of the floor slabs. So that's FRP at uh, concrete building. So the next seismic upgrade uh, method um, that we used um, on a URN building is at the Buena Vista Winery, and this was with MKM Structural Engineers. The Buena Vista Winery's historic winery complex established in 1857 and is the oldest commercial winery in California. The historic structures, the press house is constructed in 1862 in the cellar building, which is this one, um, constructed in 1864, represent the first gravity feed stone winery buildings in Northern California. The winery was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. So this is a tax credit project. Um, I think it was mentioned by Antonio Aguilar um, last week in his presentation. And the building was strengthened based on the California Historic Building Code again. It was not performance-based like Building 105, uh, but the CHBC or the California Historic Building Code um, has provisions for archaic, archaic materials based on testing, some of which was te uh, touched on um, in Michael's presentation. Uh, we did supplemental in order strength test uh, to supplement uh, core testing that had been done in 1990. Um, this, um, sorry, uh, this construction type actually is pretty typical of um, wineries in this uh, area in California, which is basically uh, unreinforced masonry walls, um, then a heavy timber post and beam system. Um, sorry, my mouse is sensitive. Long span interior floors. Um, stone caves excavated into the hillside. And here are some historic images. The, uh, the let's see, um, the cellar building is in the background and the press house is in the foreground. They're just fun to see some historic images. Some more historic images when it was first built. Here's an image of the building um, after the 1906 earthquake. So you can see there was substantial damage um, it was actually closed to the public after the 1989 earthquake. Um, when we uh, started on the project, you can see significant masonry cracking, um, cracks telegraphing through the mortar joints and also what is a volcanic um, sandstone. Some more cracking. So the decision here um, to use the center coring was, again, it was a tax credit project and there was a real desire on the part of the owner to create a seismic upgrade option that was, what was minimally, was invisible. So the first step was to strengthen the masonry walls so that we could then connect the roof and the walls to them. So the center coring and the repointing was the combined strengthening approach. Uh, these elevations actually show exactly where the center coring went through these masonry walls. So part of the, and back again to the, the importance of testing, was um, we had to do the core testing of, of the masonry to understand the strength of the mortar as required by the building code. So the cores disbanded, uh, basically meaning that the strength of the existing construction was, was pretty much zero. So first what we had to do is we had to repair the, mix, the masonry walls on the exterior, which involved reinstalling uh, stone units, uh, extensive repointing. Um, here's some images of the building being repointed. And, and then what we did was the was the center coring when and in these cores we poured um, grout um, and rebar. And um, interestingly, uh, here what we did is when we poured in the the grout, um, we used two times as much grout because even with the repointing of the exterior of the walls, so much there were so many cavities in the wall that the grout just sort of poured right into those cavities. 
um, and that's how we achieved our wall strength. Um, to touch back on, um, Dan had mentioned, again, the importance of using softer limes on masonry. Um, here, we the intention was to use the nat natural hydraulic lime, but it turns out that it would have taken 24 months to get the full strength of the natural hydraulic lime, which means we couldn't occupy the building. And so what ended up happening is we used a selective approach of um, type S mortar and the natural hydraulic lime in a, such a way um, to prevent the cracking of the stone and in strategically locate it to give us the strength so that we could actually move into the building. As you can see here, you get the full strength within 28 days, where here it would have taken 24 months to get the full strength. And then uh, just a really quick touch on the other, you know, the other upgrade of these types of building was again, um, the wood components here, we replaced the Dutchman repair at the columns with concealed anchors. And of course, connecting the floor uh, to the now strengthened walls. Um, so a good way to see that your um, seismic upgrade worked um, is actually an earthquake. Um, this is an image of downtown Napa earthquake um, in 2014. Here's an image of Buena Vista. There's the upper center of the crater. Here's Napa. Here's Buena Vista. So you can see it wasn't in the red zone, but it was still a, a, it was still had a in a very strong earthquake zone. And you could see really it was minimal, minimal earthquake damage um, at this is the north wall. There was definitely some cracking, but it was exciting to see that the seismic upgrade approach uh, worked. Um, really quickly on then onto the Portland Union Station. Um, Portland Union Station was designed by Van Brunt and Howe Kansas City, uh, structural engineer, sorry, Degenkolb engineers, um, and it was built in 1892. The building's known as Union Station when it was opened for service on 1896. Um, the tra three transcontinental railroads reached Portland between 1883 and 1887. The project included 100% uh, re-roof and replacement of the stamped metal tiles and extensive exterior repairs. The re-roof triggered the attachment of the roof to the walls. Um, so you can see uh, all of these roofs had to be attached to the URM walls. The building had not, um, the rest of the building did not have, had not yet, it is currently or just completed a seismic upgrade, but at the time it had not been upgraded. So in order to correctly attach the roof to the walls, here's um, a view of the waiting room. It's a triple height space. And in order to properly attach the roof to the walls, we did have to reinforce those walls we really couldn't do any sort of seismic upgrade on the inside because of these marble panels. Obviously on the exterior, um, minimal, we couldn't have anything that was visible. And so here, what we ended up doing is also center pouring. Um, interestingly enough here, we, what ended up happening is as we were pouring the grout into the pores, we started to get leaking uh, and more so on the exterior of the grout. And so we ended up putting the, putting the grout into these sleeves so that we wouldn't have, and then the rebar, so we wouldn't have the grout pouring out of the, the walls. Um, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to hurry. Um, the, and here's an image of the equipment used for the coring. <laughs> so my final project, and I'm gonna sort of rush through this a little bit, I apologize, um, is a base isolation project. This is the Oregon State Capitol. Um, this is basically a very large project and it's been phased. Um, the design architect was SRG. They, they did all of the um, project management and the design and ARG was responsible for the exterior closure and um, basically detailing the seismic joint around the perimeter of the building and the structural engineer was for Elsa Sir and Katina. So this was, it's, again, uh, this building um, was um, holistic seismic upgrades, including base isolation. Um, it was the, while the capital um, does not require use of the building immediately after a large earthquake, it needed to be occupied within 30 days. Um, so the, that implied our performance was very close to immediate occupancy because of that fact, which is what, again, triggered the need for a base isolation, because essentially that meant that the building could be inhabited more quickly uh, than a lesser seismic upgrade solution. Um, and so here, this was a, a it's a complex project. The main building, and there's a wing in the back here, is going to be base isolated. 
And these wings that were built in 1977 will have a more traditional seismic approach. So basically the base isolation scheme is going to have to separate not only the building from the ground, but also from these two adjacent buildings. So this is a couple of images of the 1938 building with the sort of very precious interior finishes, which precludes doing any sort of demolition. This actually did get a, a substantial a seismic upgrade, the dome, um, and this was an, the, actually about 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so interestingly enough, so back again to the question of what is a URM building. So this is a concrete frame building and the way it was constructed is concrete frame, URM infill, and then of course we had the hollow tile with the finishes on the inside. Here's an image. Basically the stone rested on top of each other and then they had these steel flanges that sort of were embedded into the URM walls. Here's some more image of the construction. So part of back again to the importance of testing, we did a lot of channeling. Um, here you can actually see these, um, these, these angles here, um, these attachments that connected the stone into the URM walls. And we sketched all of these to get the exact dimensions and locations. Um, looking at the foundation, here we did testing, um, out of plane wall testing. Essentially what it was, we built a wall uh, this is an, another wall. And then, so here's the new wall, here's the historic wall, and we put a bladder in here and filled it up with air. And we had to test how, how strong was the attachment of the existing marble to the URM brick. The, an interesting part of going through this process is understanding that even if the building is base isolated, there are still shear walls and there was still the concern, there's still going to be seismic forces on that building despite the fact that that's base isolated. So there did have to be other seismic work besides just base isolating. And so we were concerned that we, we might anyway have to attach all the stone to the walls, which we end up not, it, 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 it actually, the stone was actually pretty uh, well attached to the building and we didn't have to add additional anchorage because of that testing. Here's an image of a URM wall. Um, I mean, this is a hollow clay tile wall. And these also traditionally, the traditional upgrade this would have to either be replaced or else it would have to have another wall built next to it to support it. And you can see here what we ended up doing because it was base isolated, we could keep all the hollow clay tile walls and simply strap them to the structure in many locations. Here's another image and here's a picture of the ceiling, which is actually at this time basically holding up these uh, hollow clay tile walls. A very quick image. Um, it's very complicated when you do design these, uh, the seismic joint, you basically have a two foot moat around the entire uh, perimeter of the building. Here are the base isolators. And so basically you're just literally isolating the building from the ground. So the ground is shaking and the, theoretically the building is, has just minor shaking. And so really a lot of effort goes into designing every single location where the building is, um, separated from the ground because this, when the earth starts to, to shake, this is the part that starts to have, this is where you want the failure, but you also have to make it look attractive and so that you don't notice it. Um, a couple of, this is a, a couple of examples of what um, these conditions can look like when it's completed. Uh, we also worked on the Pasadena City Hall. This was with Pharrell Alcicer. Um, this is also a base isolated project. It was completed in 1987, listed on the National Register. Um, and this was also a lead gold project. But um, really quickly, I'm racing through it now. What's nice about this, again, you can really see the interior, the precious finishes, and the importance of having to make sure that this seismic joint seamlessly blends in with uh, surrounding um, the perimeter of the building. Um, you can see the seismic joint about a two foot all the way around the building. It was a little bit simpler than the Oregon State Capitol just because it was just one building and we didn't have to separate from any adjacent buildings. And here you can again see how the building is separated from the ground on these base isolators. And here's some images of the, the, the base isolation. 
these are the isolators. Um, at the time, I think they were only being fabricated in Japan, but now you can actually buy um, these base isolators in California. They're becoming a little bit more common in the US. So in conclusion, um, I feel like ARG has been lucky to explore alternative seismic upgrade solutions because we've had high profile historic buildings and clients motivated to consider creative seismic upgrade approaches. The hope is that as an industry, we can keep pushing for creative seismic upgrades um, solutions and somehow help end what appears to be a deadlock that we are in where URM upgrades seem so expensive, complicated, and invasive that we can't seem to route a path to help building owners strengthen the URM, URM buildings, many of which are in private ownership and with little historic protections. So thank you for your time and I hope we keep having conversations like this to help us move our industry along. Thank you.